shit. How many of you guys had that song in your head this week? You're welcome. <laughs> I knew that was the Holy Spirit's idea to put that song because I didn't know that song. I just walked around the kitchen working on the sermon that day and all of a sudden I heard in my head, that's not my name. I was like, what was that? So I Googled it, that's what you do. And, uh, and I discovered that song and I thought, wow, where in the world did I hear that? But you know, the brain is an amazing thing. It just, it holds stuff. Sometimes they can hold the wrong stuff, amen? amen. Got to guard what we put in there. Guard your gates. Well, it's Labor Day weekend. Some people went to the beach, but all the broke folks came to church. <laughs> Give it up for the broke folks. Some of y'all refused to go. I ain't broke. I didn't want to go. I went last week. Well, the rest of us are just broke. We'd be there if we could. Here we are. But, uh, but seriously, I'm, I'm glad to be with you guys. I'm excited. We're in the second part of our series on identity theft. Uh, last week, uh, we started a new series. I hope you, you were here to be a part of that. If you were, we, I think we do have it on Facebook, on our YouTube channel. But we've been talking about the importance of our identity, and I am super excited. And... Uh, like Smokey and the Bandit said, I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So I'm going to start right with the word and we're going to go with this thing right after I pray. Are you ready to pray? Father, we thank you for this opportunity. I ask you now, Holy Spirit, just to uh, clear our minds, clear our hearts. I ask you to speak through me and that you administer to us right where we are. And if there's anything that I say that you need to customize and fix and rework it before it hits anybody's ears so it can just what they needed to hear, then please do that. Thank you for your word, Jesus. Everybody say, speak to me. Amen. Amen. Let's start in Genesis chapter 32. I don't have this on the screen today, I don't believe, but it's going to be Genesis 32, and I'm going to begin with verse 22. I'm going to read the passage, uh, a, few, a few verses, and then I want to stop and share with you what God has shown me for you today. Somebody say, identity theft. Genesis chapter 32, chapter 32. We're going to be talking about a man named Jacob. A man named Jacob. Last week, we talked about Abram and Sarah and their name change. You may recognize there's a pattern in these three sermons. We're talking about people who have legal name changes. Anybody ever change their name? Raise your hand if you've ever changed your name. Some of you are like, I'm in the witness protection program. I really can't talk about it. The rest of us, it was probably just ladies that went through uh, marriage or, or divorce or maybe a child that went through adoption. When you get adopted, you get a new name. Come on, somebody. You got Genesis chapter 32, say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Verse 22 says this, And when he arose that night and took his two wives, that's already messed up, man. <laughs> Bless his heart. His two female servants and his 11 sons, good gracious, and crossed over the ford of the Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man, that's a capital M, which we'll see as an angel. And most people would, uh, most scholars would agree this was probably the what we call the angel of the Lord. In other words, it's uh, God has decided to pay a visit Sometimes he does that and they call it the angel of the Lord. Uh, I believe that uh, according to a couple other verses that confirm it as well. So as we're reading this, understand that Jacob is dealing with God. It says, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Have you ever wrestled with God? Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. Did you hear that? If, you, if you're not sure on your who was prevailing against who, it says when he saw that he, capital H, God, did not prevail against him, little h, he touched his hip. This man was so stubborn 
that God, he wouldn't even give up to God. Anybody ever been there? It'll just kind of give somebody an elbow and say, you know you did that. God, he refused to surrender to God. He touched the, the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Verse 26. This is where I really want you to see. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, this is Jacob, here it comes. I will not let you go unless you what? I want to say it again. I want you to say it really loud. I will not let you go unless you what? Bless me. Bless me. All right, let's, let's take a few minutes to talk about this because I'm going to get to the name change in just a few minutes. That's what I normally would preach about when I talk about this passage. It's what's always ministered to me. But like John said, the word is so fresh. Every time we look at it, God's got something hidden there just for us. If we'll just do a little digging, a little reading, you'll be surprised what God does, right? And I was reading this, and usually when I get a revelation from the Lord, it starts with a bewilderment from the word. And I don't always go, wow, that's a revelation. Thank you, God. A lot of times I start with one. If you ever read the Bible, you go, huh? what is it? What? You're in a good place. Because that's where revelation usually starts. It's just if you close it, then they go, well, I don't get it. And walk off. You just miss the revelation. But if you'll stay and work with that and be like Jacob and start wrestling with the Lord, he'll probably give you something. In fact, earlier this week, I knew I was preaching on this passage. And I got home really late from the church one night. And I went in there and I was fixing something to eat because I like to eat again about 11. I don't know about y'all. And I was fixing something to eat and I, my brain was tired and I was tired. You ever like that when you come from? You're just like, but I was like, I just want to kind of veg out for a few minutes. And I just heard the Holy Spirit say, if you'll sit down at the table and open your Bible and read that passage, I'll show you something. And I actually thought about it. Y'all do it too. I really didn't know if I was in the mood to hear something from the Lord. And I'm like, yeah, God, yeah, of course. What am, I, what am I hesitating for? Let me sit down, open my Bible. And he began to speak to me very quickly. And what stood out to me was this line when Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you what? Bless me. Bless me. Now, if you don't know any of the context, any of the background of what's going on here, this will make no sense. So let me explain to you why this sticks out, because I begin to think about it. Wait a minute, God. Jacob is asking you for something. He's asking you to bless him, but Jacob is already blessed. He's already blessed. Now, last time we talked about Eve, who had already had this identity, and she was blessed spiritually. But I'm talking about blessed like in your back pocket blessed. Blessed. You know, like when you say, that guy's he's well off. Jacob was blessed. If you read the passage, I'm going to backtrack. It just, a few verses before this, it talked about how he, he was traveling. I believe it was from the land of Haran, but uh, he was traveling back to his homeland after 20 years. And for 20 years, he's been over in this new area. He went there with nothing, uh, no tangible possessions, no wealth, no bank account. When there was just his, his staff in his hand. But he got a job as a shepherd. And he began to work for this man named uh, Laban. And then, he, and you may know the story, he wanted his daughter, Rachel. Um, so he worked seven years. That's one a woman right there, okay? Woman. He worked seven years just to get this woman. And then there was a little mishap at the wedding. You can read about it. The father-in-law accidentally gave him the other daughter. There must have been some drinking involved for this whole mix-up to happen. But and he, the next morning he woke up and he had Leah. Laban had like a really pretty daughter, and then he had Leah. The Bible says she was, she was weak in the eyes. We don't know if she had sight problems or whether she just hurt your eyes. We don't know what that meant. But she was not the first choice. But that's who he woke up with. And then he, he went to Laban and he was like, what's up with that, man? I've been working on He said, you know, it's our custom. She's the oldest. Be cool. Chill out this week. I'll give Rachel to you. But I need you working for seven years. He said, okay. He had it bad. Love sick blues. He wanted Rachel. 
So he had both of these wives. That's how he ended up with two wives, and then he gets 11 sons. And there's a whole lot of sermons and nuggets and revelations there. And then eventually, after the 14 years, and then he actually begins to work for him and begins to earn his. I mean, now he's not just an employee. He, he has this deal that God works out where he says, how about I get this number of goats? I get these kind of sheep. He's a shepherd, by the way. And he always got like, the Bible says that Laban saw that everything Jacob did had God's blessing. Somebody say blessing. Had his blessing on it. By the time he left, 20 years later, he had so many goats and sheep and servants and people. He had such a company of him that he actually, it, they had to move so slow because it was such a large group of them. And, and I want you to just kind of imagine this whole room being full of goats and sheep and people and out in the parking lot and everybody. And you walk up and you're like, what is this, a city? Is this a camp? They said, no, this is Jacob's folks. This is Jacob's possession. This is Jacob's current financial situation. He's blessed. In fact, later we're going to see he's, so, he's got so much stuff that when he meets someone else who has a lot of stuff, they can't travel together because there's not enough grass in the ground to feed all these sheep and his sheep. This man is blessed. He has a lot of stuff. Knowing that, in fact, he would send them in companies. He would break his, his, his people and his possessions into groups. But yet we see when he's dealing with the angel of the Lord, he said, I won't let you go unless you... Does he need some more goats? No, it's not that. Does he, does he need some more wives? No way. Does he need more sons? Not really. He's got daughters too. He's got more sir. It's not about somebody yet. He's wrestling. And, and we forget. I mean, we don't even understand. What does this even mean? How is he wrestling? I, I don't understand all of it, but I know I've wrestled with God before. But And I've asked him to bless me before. But... Jacob's got a lot more stuff than I do. He was asking to be blessed. And then, if that's not enough, then you look further back into Jacob's history. And you may remember that Isaac was his father. And Jacob had a brother named Esau. And they were both in the womb at the same time. And, and his mother, and you remember they were, they were actually kind of like, he was always a wrestler, I guess. Because he was wrestling with Esau. In his mama's belly, ever, women I've heard you say, it feels like they're turning flips or doing calisthenics tonight. What is going on in my belly tonight? The baby's going nuts. Y'all ever been there, ladies? Or guys, after you've had too much pizza and some hot wings, you know the same similar discomfort. And Jacob and Esau were, were wrestling, and they were like, what is going on? And they said, well, there's going to be some drama. You ever had family drama? Well, there's going to be some drama between these two sons. He said, Esau is going to be born first. That means he'll be the firstborn. But Jacob is going to do some stuff, and, and it's actually, he's going to get the blessing. And you, you read it, you see what happened was when they were at a certain age, uh, Jacob was there in the house. And since Jacob was kind of more of a homeboy, not like in slain, but like stayed home more, and Esau was out in the woods and was kind of in the deer stand, and they were just different. There's different kinds of men. It don't mean you're in a man. It just means there's different kind of men. And, and Jacob was at home. Apparently, he was cooking some stew. You know, maybe he was a good cook, chef or something. Esau came in from the field, and he's been out probably on a hunt for days or weeks, and for whatever reason, he didn't get anything this time, and he was starving, and he was actually to the place where he came in. He's like, I am dying. You got some drama people in your family, right? I'm dying right now. He said, just give me some of that stew. Well, see, the word Jacob means supplanter. It means deceiver. It means one who schemes. And, and he was named that even at his natural birth. And he began to scheme. And he said, you know what? This dude right here is in a vulnerable situation. He's the firstborn. But right now, I bet he'd do anything for something to eat. I bet for this present situation to get fulfillment right now, he would trade away his future. He would trade away his birthright. So he said, I'll give you some stew for your birthright. He should have slapped Jacob right in the mouth for saying that. I mean, your birthright is what you didn't give away. Your birthright was your authority. It was your inheritance from your, from your father. The land, the, the extra portion, it, would be, it was favor. It was something you didn't just trade away casually. But 
Esau said, whatever, man, if I die, I'm not going to need my birthright. I'll take it. Just let's make the deal, handshake. He took the stew for his birthright. And it's easy to say, Esau, you're an idiot. But I've done a lot of stupid things in my past, too. I've traded away my future for a situation. I've bought things I shouldn't have bought. I've made decisions I shouldn't have made. I've... You ever done anything like that? But whether it was wrong how he got it, Jacob got it. He got the birthright. And when you have the birthright, you become like the first son. You get the double inheritance. You get the land. You're in charge. You get the authority. And I believe we can all agree whether it was wrong how he did it, the man got blessed that day. It was kind of like a giggling like Rumpelstiltskin all the way home. But he got the blessing from his brother. So he's blessed. And then later, we read the story about how when Isaac got old, his eyes became bad and he couldn't see. And Jacob came in there and did this long story of how he actually, this, the birthright was one thing, okay? I mean, that was wrong. This was a whole new level of wrong. Jacob actually went in. Isaac was getting ready to die. And when the time the father would be near death, he would place his hand on each son. And he would proclaim a blessing. And this, this blessing, see, we don't understand blessing today. And we don't appreciate the, the value and the weight of our words and the authority God's given us. But the Bible says he made us in, our, in his image. In his image he created us. And how did God form the world? He spoke. He spoke what? Words. And so they understood that in this culture. And so the father would take his hand and place it on the child. And he would speak a blessing over them. And it wasn't like, oh, you're going to do cool stuff, and God's going to be with you. It was very specific. The Holy Spirit would actually kind of prophesy through the Father, and, and He would speak things into that Son's future, God's will, God's plans. You see this time and time again in the Bible, and it always comes to pass. Well, there was a certain blessing that He would speak, and Esau was supposed to get this amazing blessing that day, or so it seemed. But Jacob snuck into the room, personified, pretended to be Esau, tricked Isaac. Isaac placed his hand on Jacob and began to speak the most amazing blessing. We mentioned, John mentioned uh, Abraham's blessing. And in, in case you didn't know, Abraham is Jacob's granddaddy. That blessing of Abraham went from Isaac, it was going to be going from line to line, would have normally come to Esau. But guess who stole the blessing? Jacob. Now, and it was such a big deal. If you read the story, when Esau came in that day, he came in, he's got everything ready for the ceremony. He's like, Father, I'm ready for my blessing. Isaac went, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. He said, oh, no. I have given your blessing away. And Isaac was like, well, don't you have another one? That's read it. He was like, don't you have, I mean, give me, come on, daddy, come, this is not right. He said, it might not be right, but it's done. I can't undo, once I speak the blessing, I can't take it back. It's the, he said, your brother stole your blessing. He said, I'll muster up something for you here. Come on up here, boy. And he speaks over him and he says some things. Some of us good and some of us not so good. One of the things that sticks out to me is he says, you know, there will be problems between you and your brother. And he said, you will live by the sword. He said, and when you get enough, he said, there will be problems between your people and your brother's people. And when you've had enough, you'll break free from the shackles from your brother. And he said, you sound like family drama to me. Esau left there that day and he said, you know what? You got me again, Jacob. This ain't over. He said, we'll let daddy pass. And we'll let the morning happen. But when all that's said and done, I'm going to kill you. We'll see who's blessed then. Because I live by the sword. Well, word got out to the mama. Jacob was mama's boy. She came to Jacob and she said, Esau is going to kill you. Jacob said, what do I do? She said, you got to get out of here. You need to go. 
we'll play it off like you're going back to my homeland, uh, you know, back back to the old era or something. To, we'll, we'll play it about it's finding your wife. We got a scheme, schemer, because that's what schemers do. And we got to get out of this. So they sent him off to find a wife, and that's where he ended up on that journey for 20 years. And even though Jacob, I mean, it's easy to say, well, you did it wrong, you're such a schemer, you got it. But we've done the same thing when we wanted to get ahead. We found ways to manipulate people. We found things to say, or we knew what to leave out and not say so that they would think what we wanted them to think, or so we could get, we've all done it. There's a little bit of Jacob in everybody. But in spite of that nature that was in him, that was a schemer, that was a trickster, a supplanter, even though that, with all that being true, we have to admit that the boy is blessed. Figure it out? No, I can't. But I can acknowledge that he had the birthright, he had the father's blessing, Everything he touched for Laban turned to gold. And then he got all the sheep. He got all the possession. He's blessed spiritually. He's blessed in the family line. He's got authority. And now he's got the finances and the portfolio to match it all. If anybody is blessed, it's Jacob. Can we agree on that? Somebody said blessed. Yet, when he's wrestling with God, he said, you might have broke my hip just then. And that is killing me right now. But I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. What are you talking about, Jacob? Have you lost your mind? Well, you have to read the passage. You read the passage and you learn something. You learn that while he was headed back to his homeland, God had visited him and said, I will be with you. He didn't say you earned it. He didn't say you deserved it. But God said, I've decided... I'm going to take care of you. And so he's on the way back, and he sends somebody ahead back to the house at the home, and he's getting, I don't know how many miles away, probably from here to bypass or something. And, and one of the, the servants come back and they said, we, we found Esau, we found Esau. And Jacob was like, okay, um, did he say anything? Because he, he had been thinking, it's been 20 years, maybe it's cool. Maybe he kind of forgot. That's stupid. He didn't forget. I stole his birthright. I stole his blessing. It was my most favorite. Mm -hmm. Did he say anything? And, and as far as we know, there's no record of them saying what he said. But they said, but we did see that when we left, he was saddling up and he's coming out here to meet you. Oh, and he's bringing 400 men. Did they, um, were they wearing, you know, like, 400? Did they have construction hats on? I mean, how many? 400 men. Were there any women? No. Did he bring any children? No. But he's bringing 400 men and he's on the way. Okay. I don't think he forgot. I don't think he forgot at all. 400 men. I got some slave girls and a few shepherd helpers and a whole lot of goats. Um, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Although, I thought I got ahead. I, I thought I'd beat this thing. From all in, all in, yeah, from all appearances, it looks like my past is coming back for me. Somebody say past. Esau represents the past sins of Jacob's life. Everything that Jacob had done wrong that we know of was all about Esau. And it seemed to me that his past was not coming to haunt him. It was coming to judge him. It was coming to bring justice. And the truth is, Jacob deserved everything Esau had in mind. And if I skip ahead, I want to skip, but I'm coming back to chapter 33.
the next morning, it says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maid servants. Can you just see this unfolding? They're seeing the, it's like in the movie where you see the dust before you see the people. You know, what is that? I hear, no, I hear like this times 400. And he's like, okay, all right, all right, all right. Y'all, Rachel, you take some of the kids that way. You take some of that. And y'all, we're going to split up. He ain't going to get all of us. It's really, it's, it's really about me anyway. It's not y'all. I can imagine the stress that he was facing. But I truly believe that Esau was coming to kill Jacob. And I truly believe that just like Jacob, every one of us has a past. And we have a sinful past. And the truth is we deserve every bit of judgment that's coming to us if God doesn't step in and intervene. That is the purpose of Jesus. Every one of us has an Esau. We're all a Jacob. And we need a Jesus. We need God to come in and bless us. The blessing that Jacob was begging God for was the blessing of salvation. Save me from Esau. Save me from my past. I know I deserve what I have coming. But God, what you say, God, I can't let you go. I, I can't even, I, there's no way. And you know what? You know what? The angel of the Lord, Jacob knew he couldn't beat Esau, and he knew he couldn't handle 400 men. He knew he would fall into judgment, and he was trying to scheme and divide and fix things. We always try to fix it. We always try to avoid the consequences for what, well, I know I told that lie, but if I tell another lie, maybe I can get out of that lie. And we try to scheme and get out of stuff. But it's coming for you. Esau's coming. And then... To show, I believe, this is my opinion, the angel of the Lord knew that Jacob was in a mess, had an enemy he couldn't defeat, but he was going to try to do the best he could in the situation, and he was begging God for help, but then God touched his hip. Now, if you were about to get in a fight with somebody, the last thing you need to do is to be like this right here. Jacob came in the tent going, well, I don't know if I can handle this. He walked out going, I know I can't handle it now. <laughs> That's what the law does for us. Because sometimes we think, well, I think I can be good enough. I mean, my good will definitely outweigh my bad. I'm not a bad person. The law is just like that broken hip. If you thought you could walk right before, then God gave us the Ten Commandments and said, let me show you how broken you really are. This is what you look like in the spirit trying to be good. You'll never defeat your past. You'll never overcome your sins. You can't handle Esau. We need salvation. He walked out knowing he couldn't handle it. The end of the story is there in verse 2. It says, And he put the maidservants and their children in front of Leah and her children behind, Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times. He kissed the dirt seven times in front of Esau, begging for mercy with his broke hip until he came near his brother. Check this out. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Talk about a turn of events. The same one that was coming to judge him is now running to embrace him. That's a picture of Jesus because the Bible says that Jesus is coming back, and there's gonna only gonna be two responses. One says he has fire in his eyes and sword in the hand, and the other one said he's gonna have a big wedding feast, and we're gonna love, and we're gonna be embraced, and he's gonna say, "Come on in, well done." There's only going to be two responses. It depends on what happens in between what I just read. So, a lot of people say, well, maybe Esau was just coming out there. He just coincidentally had four. No, he didn't. He was coming to kill that choker. 400 men. 
And God changed his heart. God said, no. Let me change your heart. What happened to change his heart? Let's look back at, at, at a few verses and then we're done. I want to start back where he says in verse chapter 32, verse 26. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. So the, the request on the table is, God, please save me. Bless me. Save me from my sins. Save me from my past. Save me from my... Save me. That's the request on the table. So how does God respond in verse 27? So he said to him, what is your name? What an odd response. God, please save me. Help me. Bless me. He said, well, first we got to deal with who you are. What's your name? What's your identity? Who are you right now? Who have you been? And he had to respond. He said, Jacob. That word in the Hebrew means schemer, supplanter, trickster, manipulator, thief. It's who I am. It's almost as if God said, well, we can't work with that. We can't move any forward like that. We gotta change your name. Before we can change your outcome, we gotta change your identity. So before we can change your outcome, we gotta change who you are. We're gonna have to change your name, boy. Verse 28, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Israel. Israel, prince with God. And Laura said we were this morning, we're princes, we're princesses. God has changed who Jacob is from scheme or tricks. Had he done those things? Had he lived up to that name? You bet you had a master's degree in it, selling an online course. But now God says, you know what? That's no longer who you are. I'm no longer a slave to fear, no longer a slave to sin. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means prince of God, prince with God. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So at this point we see, he's asked for salvation. And God is saying, well, before I change your outcome, before I eliminate the consequences, if I just saved you from your sin, but I didn't change who you are, I would do you a great disservice. So many times we say, God, would you just please fix this? And he said, let's start with you. Can we start with you? Because if, if I don't fix you, then you'll be back here in six months. And we'll be having this discussion again. we got to change who you are. And he did. He changed his name. I love this part. It's my favorite part. Jacob, it appears to me from the reading that if Jacob said it with such exclamation that time, I won't let you go until you bless me. It appears that wasn't the first time that night he brought up, God, please help me, bless me, help me, help me, help me. It appears this had been the ongoing conversation. God, help me. You ever been there where he's like, God, we've been going through this. God, please help me. Save me from this. He's been bringing that up over. And over. It's the only thing that's been on Jacob's mind is Esau. The only thing that's been on his mind is his past, his problems, his, his situation has consumed him. And all he's brought up to God this far is, God, please help me. But when God changed his name, Jacob wants to talk about something else. He wants to talk about something else. Verse 29. Then Jacob asked, say, tell me your name. God, now that you've told me who I am, would you reveal to me who you are? I, I was so consumed with my problems and all that, and you haven't changed my outcome yet. You haven't promised me Esau is not coming tomorrow. But what I really need more of now, God, that I have this revelation that you 
changed who I am, would you begin to show me who you are? That's the response. That's the response that we should be bringing. When we come in here and worship, when you're riding down the road and it's just you and or maybe your kids or everybody's in the car, but I don't know, but, and you hear that song, How great is our God, sing with me. Your soul should begin to, your spirit should, should begin to say, yes, sing with me, how great. You should be the worship leader in your car. You should be the worship leader in your people. You should be the worship leader of yourself. If ain't nobody but you, you should be leading you, saying, Name above all names, you are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. Yeah, I told you in the beginning of a series, two, two series ago, I said, if you're going to get back on track, you're going to have to start worshiping. Some of you still aren't worshiping. How do I know? I'm in it with you. I'm not mad at you. You're just missing out. I feel like I'm eating ice cream and you're over there eating rice. <laughs> I got chocolate pudding and you got rice pudding. You got tricks. You're going, well, that's just not. I encourage you so much. I challenge you so much in the area of worship. Not because I'm mad at you, but because I know what you're missing, man of God. Don't you sing? The Bible says you should. Stop being stubborn. You prideful, missing God's best for your life because you won't submit in that area. Read the Bible and decide, I'm going to do it. Y'all looking at me mad. Talk to me afterward if you're mad about it. I'll talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Because I believe in this. I know what I'm talking about. Trust me. Start by yourself. Don't, even, I, don't start on a Sunday. It might be too crazy for you. But go home, get out in the yard, get in the woods and say, I don't care if you can, can't sing a lick. Say, God, you're a good God. Yeah. Oh, you are good. Just start right there and say, you are good. And you're like, well, he knows he's good. But you don't. If you did, you'd already be saying it. I'm waiting on you to do it. Man up. I love you. I want to challenge you. I'm trying to help you. There's other areas we need to man up in. And I got issues. And I don't always get it right. I got problems too. But I need somebody to kick me in the tail every now and then. Say, man up, Joy. Mm. Look at your neighbor and say, don't get mad. You're only mad if it applies to you. Because the breakfast ain't bad. There ain't been it. But when God changes, it's just a natural response. When it says when he changed his name to Israel, he said, he looked at him. He said, I know I got problems tomorrow. My problems haven't gone away. I'm not even going to wait to praise you until all my problems work out. I'll, I just want to know right now, while I'm in your prayer, I don't want... I've, I've kind of wasted the whole night. The God of the universe came to my house. Or maybe I came to his house. And I wasted my whole night. I wasted my whole hour and a half sitting there thinking about this, thinking about that, being frustrated because Joey won't leave me alone. Uh, but I, I should have been focusing on saying, God, what is your name? What is your name? Would you show me today? What is your, who are you? Who are you, God? Who are you in my heart? Who are you in my finances? Who are you in my marriage? Who are you in regard to my past? Who are you in my future? Who are you? God wants to reveal. Remember I told you last week that our identity is always going to be connected to his identity. We sometimes want him to change who we are, but we don't want to pay the price to learn who he is. It won't work that way. It won't work that way, and your situation won't change because God's not a vending machine. But I feel like I can hear the heart of God in this passage. Because Jacob said in verse 20,
Bible in Isaiah. Tell me your name, I pray. I swear to you that in my little mind, I think he smiled. I think God he's like, the boy's getting it. I think he was a proud papa right then. He said, you know what? We used to wrestle every time we meet. All we did was wrestle. He never wanted to surrender. I had to kick him in his hip. He still wouldn't listen. But when he finally let me, when he finally admitted who he was, and he let me change it, and then he responded in worship and adoration, saying, "God, who are you?" That's my boy. That's my boy. All the time. Cue the music. That's what God's looking for, guys. I love the fact. Look, I, I, to me, it seems that God smiled because God, He says. Why is it that you ask about my name? Now remember, it's not because he didn't know the answer. I think he was just enjoying it so much he said, like we said this out, well how about that? <laughs> how about that? Because there's no further dialogue. Jacob doesn't answer the question. He says, why is it that you ask about my name? Change that. You begin the process. You get it there. It says, and then. Somebody say, then. Yeah. Says he blessed him. Yeah. When did he bless him? Then. God, if you bless me, I'll do la 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 la. It might not work like that. He says, if you'll bless me, then I'll do la 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 la. Why don't you bless me first? Bless me first. Why don't you go first this time? I've been going first for like 800 times, God says. Why don't you go first this time? I just see God smiling on Jacob. Why is not that you asked about my name? And he blessed him there. And I wish that it told us exactly what God said. It's like, okay, God, when you blessed him, what did you say? Because I would probably like to pray that over myself and use it like a formula or something. And, but it doesn't say what he said. I'm not sure he said anything. It could be that when he blessed him, it was when he went over here to Esau with 400 men who was going, when I see Jacob, you know what I'm going to do? First thing I'm going to do is slap him around his mouth. And then after that, I'm going to tell my boys to hold him. And then after that, I'm going to make him pay. I'm going to go because I'm pretty sure that's what he was imagining. I've been waiting 20 years for this. I've dreamed about this revenge. And the Holy Spirit, when he blessed Jacob, he went over here to his judgment and said, no, no, it's over. It's over. Forgive me. Debt's paid. Let it go. You love him. When you see him, embrace him. You miss him. And he saw him like, what is happening right now? Did I mind trick? I mean, <laughs> I didn't bring 400 people out here in the wilderness to... And imagine the 400 guys are going... What did he tell you we was coming out here for? <laughs> he told me, when we saw Jacob, it was going to get real bad. He told me that too. Now they're kissing and stuff. <laughs> we still get paid, right? <laughs> I don't know how it went down, but I know that the blessing was the change of the outcome. God wants to change your outcome. But will you first let him change your name? If he hasn't changed your name yet, you, we need to do that today. God is in the name-changing business. The devil is in the identity theft business, trying to steal from Christians who you are, trying to take away, trying to say, you're not worthy. You still have that past. What about Esau? Remember what you did? You said, shut up. It doesn't matter what I did. God erased it. In His grace, the blood of Jesus has covered it. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Behold, all things have become new. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. That's who I am. Pastor Larry sings a song called New Name. He's given us a new name. Do you have a new name? If you don't know if you have a new name, you probably don't have a new name. But it's ready and available. The paperwork has already been filled out. It's just waiting for you to sign up. You're pre-approved. You're eligible. 
It's like that credit card thing you get in the mail. How do they find you? God knows where you've been the whole time. When you ran, he followed. When you left, he waited. He's ready. So, let's do it like this. Let's take a minute to respond. That's the way, if you'll come up and just, uh, just play. I want to take a few minutes. Let's take a minute to respond to what God said to us and what he's done now. I may have preached this message and you're like, Joey, I'm saved. That's not me. I know my identity is right. But if I was honest, I do have this little area right here where I haven't really been living who I was. Well, you're not the only one. But you can come and let us pray for you in that area. We'd like to stand with you if you're not saved. And we want to pray with you. Whatever God's dealing with you, I want to take a few minutes before we leave today. You've got to bar off, so don't, don't be rushing me. They're already packed at the restaurant. Those three churches have been out for 30 minutes. <laughs> Thought that was my phone. So I believe the Holy Spirit is here. I want a few of the prayer team guys to come up. Guys and girls. Let's just take a few minutes. Have some time of prayer and worship. And I know what you're thinking. I can do it right here. Yeah, but you've been doing that. You've been trying that. Let us come up and agree with you. Come up and let us pray with you. Who would be the first ones to say, yeah, I need prayer. Maybe it's about something totally different. I don't want to rush. Why don't we just stay it together so it's not like you're like you got an audience. Let's begin to sing and pray. I am a child.
we're going to take just another minute for prayer. Is there something that we could agree with you on? There's something that you're believing God for that you need to do. We could agree with you. Stand with you in prayer. We'd love to do that. The Bible talks about the power of agreement. Please don't leave not knowing whether you're born again, whether you have a new name, whether you're God's child. Don't leave not knowing. Let us pray with you. That hardest step is the first step. After you get that one, they get easier and easier as you come up. If he is a man of God, 
trust his father, that his father speaks to him. Now for the men. Don't let your wife be the only person in your house who prays. If you want her to trust what you've got to say, give us something to be trustworthy about. You pray over your wife out loud so she can hear you. And I promise you, I promise you, what you speak will come true. And your wife will trust you more and more with every syllable that comes out of your mouth. Everybody been spanked equally today? I gave one earlier than I just received one. Reap, reap what you sow, right? Amen. Yes, two important things I'm being reminded of from every direction. The offering and prayer. Let's start with the offering. So you guys will have a seat and let's do that as we get ready to close up. I'm going to give you a couple of...